Thank you. I am here today uh, as a follower of Jesus Christ. And you've got to know that there was a, a time when I could not imagine those words coming out of my mouth. In fact, back in the late Pleistocene in the 70s when I was a student here, uh, Christianity and the teachings of Christ were the farthest thing from my mind. And I'll tell you the reason why I didn't want anything to do with Christianity. And I'm a bit embarrassed to say this because it's a little bit uncharitable, but I thought all Christians were either dumb or ugly, or both. And that's why they went to church and Christianity, because they couldn't think for themselves. Um, and also, they couldn't get acceptance elsewhere, so they went to church where, you know, everybody had to love each other. That was one of the rules. It was on the back of the church there, and so this is where they can get acceptance. Now, I, I've learned some things in the 27 or so years since my mind has been changed on this, and one of those things has to do about Christians being dumb. What I learned was, well, a lot of Christians are dumb. And they hold to Christianity for less than intelligent reasons. But as I reflected on this, I realized that maybe a lot of Christians are dumb, but a lot of non-Christians are dumb too and hold to their beliefs for less than intelligent reasons. And so that doesn't get us very far. What I'd like to show you this, uh, this afternoon is that Christianity is not dumb that the things that Jesus believed about the nature of the world are worthy of your consideration. Now, I'm not here to convert you today. It's not my job to do that. In fact, it took me about two and a half years of very hard thinking about these issues before I had a kind of paradigm shift in the way I viewed the world. So I don't expect that to happen overnight to you guys. And uh, I have a different goal, though. And the goal that I have is I, I want to give you something worth thinking about. I kind of want to put a rock in your shoe if you haven't thought much about these things before and show you that it may turn out that Christianity and the teachings of Jesus Christ and the whole issue of following Christ may not be as absurd as you might have thought it, but it may turn out that the foundational concepts that drive the Christian worldview actually resonate with the deepest intuitions that you have about the nature of the world. And I'm going to focus on one particular issue. It's an idea. And I think this idea is important because I think as we probe this idea a little bit and think about it and ask some questions about it and give it something like a rigorous analysis as best as we can do in about 45 minutes, that we might learn something in the process about the key to understanding the nature of the world. I know that sounds like a bold claim, and, but I mean it. And I hope that when you leave, you've got a, a big rock in your shoe, something to think about that has to do with the way Jesus understood the nature of the world. And I want to start off by telling you something that happened to me about, oh, about five years ago now. I like having conversations with people, kind of on the street, as it were, about spiritual things, just to get an idea of what they think, where they're coming from, and what their ideas are. And so I was in a chiropractor's office getting ready to get cracked, I guess, is this. They should call them chirochractors, actually, because they crack you. And I had some therapy I needed, so I was there, and I was getting prepped by this young lady. And I thought, well, I'm going to ask her this question. Uh, and so I asked permission. Can I ask you a more personal question? She said, well, what is it? I said, well, I'll ask you some questions about morality. I've been doing some thinking about it, and I'm wondering about the nature of morality. And I want to know if I can ask you this question. She said, all right, go ahead. I said, is morality objective in some sense? Or is morality relative? Is it up to the individual? She said, well, what do you mean by morality? I thought, this is not a good sign. I said, well, morality, you know, right and wrong, which is right and wrong. So we started to talk, and it became clear to me that she's having a very difficult time even understanding the nature of the question. So I thought, okay, I'm going to give her what we call a clear case example. It's like a question or a challenge that's easy to answer and meant to get the ball rolling. It's kind of like, who's buried in Grant's tomb? And what's the number to 911? You know, the obvious ones. So I offer her this. I said, is murder wrong? The taking of an innocent life. Well, I said, well, well what? Well, I'm thinking. And I'm thinking, what's to think about? Because this is the easy one. This is to get things rolling. And she's having a hard time with it. I said, well, I don't understand the confusion. Are you suggesting that there are conditions uh, in which it's okay just to simply take another human life without any justification whatsoever. She said, well, you know, I think it's kind of an individual matter. So this question wasn't easy enough. So I thought, okay, i got to give her another one. How about this? Is it okay to torture babies for fun? <laughs> well, 
I wouldn't want them to do that to my baby. Now you think about that response for a moment. Do you see how the response is not a response to my question? My question was whether the act itself was wrong, and what she responded to me with is a, is a, is a response of personal preference. I wouldn't like this. And that response is key to everything that I want to talk about this afternoon. Uh, and I pointed this out to her. I said, you know, that's not my question. I, I wouldn't want somebody to feed me a plate of burnt food, but I wouldn't say that they are wrong or immoral for doing that. What I want to know is, if at any time, in any culture, under any set of circumstances, it could possibly be morally justified to torture babies just for the pleasure it brings you. Long pause. And then she finally said, well, I think that everybody should be allowed to decide for themselves. This actually happened. I'm not making this up. I make some things up. I didn't make this up. Uh, and I imagine that if this woman were awakened in the middle of that very night by the plaintive screams of a child next door being tormented by his or her parents for the pure pleasure it brought the parents, this woman would have considered those people barbaric and would have dialed 911. It shows, by the way, that when we're not trying to think about it, sometimes our moral common sense or our moral intuitions rise immediately to the surface and actually accurately inform the circumstances, but when she was forced to have to stop and begin to think about it and talk it through, she was not even able to bring herself to, to, to condemn torturing babies for fun as obviously immoral. Now, what's going on here? I do not think that this woman's inability to respond in that circumstance is unusual in our culture today. In fact, it's, it's more the rule than the exception when people are forced to think about things. Now, when they're just responding, generally they make moral statements quite frequently and accurately, but in this circumstance where she's asked to think it through, she can't do that. What's going on here is the power of an idea. And that idea is called relativism. It's the view, simply put, that when it comes to questions of morality, of moral facts, of moral dictates, of moral rules, that there are no rules out there, as it were. You have math rules out there, arguably. You have uh, uh, natural laws out there, as it were. And so you could differ on the nature of natural laws, but in differing on your views of natural laws, it doesn't change the way the natural laws themselves are, because they're out there. They're objects of the universe. But when it comes to moral claims, and also for religious claims largely, people say this is not a function of knowledge. You don't know moral things. You don't know religious things. You just believe them. And different people have different beliefs. And then added on to that, if not spoken, at least implied, is that, the, that everybody's belief is equally legitimate. I like to think of relativism as it applies to these issues, uh, kind of like ice cream. You like one flavor, I like another. I don't say you're wrong because you have a different preference in ice cream. You don't say I'm wrong because I have a different preference. And when it comes to moral questions, you have what you like, I have what I like, and we don't judge each other. The truth is relative to the subject. Uh, we don't push our morality on other people. There's another way. Or, or don't judge me. These are statements. Uh, who are you to say what's right or wrong? All kinds of statements that we hear in our culture that are coming from this place of of uh, extreme skepticism about the existence of any moral thing at all. And so morals are just reduced to individual preferences. Now, just as an aside, think about this for a moment. What is it that holds our culture together? The things that really holds our culture together are common values expressed through law. So we have things that we commonly hold to be good, that we encourage in law, and commonly hold to be evil, that we discourage in law. And this helps our culture work. Aristotle says that law stands upon the necessary foundation of morality. Some people say, well, you can't legislate morality. If Aristotle's right, and I think he is in this issue, uh, morality is the only thing you can legislate. Because if the law is not based on some concept of the common good, and it is just there to enforce some personal preference, this is despotism. This isn't legitimate use of the law. Now, what happens if law stands on a necessary foundation of morality, but morality turns out to be nothing in particular? 
the law more and more becomes simply a raw exercise of power, and there's not even an attempt anymore to justify the use of the power morally. And I think this is the postmodern approach. Morality is irrelevant. It doesn't exist. Power is all that matters. Well, I want to take some time this, this afternoon and examine the concept. I want to look to see if this is, we've de defined it, at least for our purposes here. I want to uh, give it somewhat of a rigorous analysis. I want to uh, speak to what I think is the myth of moral neutrality. I want to expose the myth of tolerance, because it ties in here. And I want to give you a handful of, of, of what I consider fatal flaws to this whole notion of moral relativism. I'm a moral realist. What that means is I think there are moral rules out there. And I think if it turns out that there are moral rules that actually exist, it invites certain questions about how those rules might have come into being, why they're in this universe the way they are, and why they happen to apply to human beings. I think those are very, very vital questions. And that's kind of where we're going to end. And at the end, I'm going to, uh, hopefully, I'll have about 15 minutes to invite questions from you folks for clarification or challenge. And I'll do my best to answer it. This is what I do on the radio show on the weekends, uh, Sunday afternoons. 3 to 5, AM 740, actually, if you want to tune in there. And so we'll do a little bit of that here at, at the end. Um, by the way, if you're, if you're having trouble in the light taking notes, I want you to know that you can sit back and relax with the knowledge that you can have my full set of notes, all 30 pages or something, everything that I have to say here, plus a whole lot more that I don't have time to say, in the back at the product table back there. It's just three, a couple, three bucks, I think, is what it costs. But it'll save you a lot of writing, and you won't get it wrong. So we make that available to you. If you uh, want to follow what I have to say, there's some material that we handed out that has a loose outline that I'll loosely be following. Okay. Let me start out by reading something to you. Uh, what I want to do here at the beginning is talk about the myth of moral neutrality. And I'd like to read to you a characterization of this view that I, that I want to examine. And uh, the, the characterization is written by Faye Waddleton. Now, some of you might recognize the name the woman who is the former president of Planned Parenthood. Now, I don't read this to ridicule her, although our politics and our moral views to some degree differ. I'm reading this because I think it's a very, very well-written, clear articulation of the view that I want to challenge here. In fact, it's going to be so good that many of you are going to nod in agreement when I read this, like this is common sense. And those of you who might be inclined to disagree with some things that she has to say, you might feel uncomfortable with what she says. And you might think, well, I think there's something wrong with it, but I don't know how I could disagree with what she's just said without sounding like an idiot. So let me read to you what she's written. She says, like most parents, I think that a sense of moral responsibility is one of the greatest gifts I can give my child. But teaching morality doesn't mean imposing my moral values on others. It means sharing wisdom, giving reasons for believing as I do, and then trusting others to think and judge for themselves. My parents' morals were deeply rooted in religious conviction, but tempered by tolerance, the essence of which is respect for other people's views. They taught me that, the, that reasonable people may differ on moral issues, and that fundamental respect for others is morality of the highest order. I have devoted my career to ensuring a world in which my daughter, Felicia, can inherit that legacy. I hope the tolerance and respect I show her as a parent is reinforced by the work she sees me doing every day, fighting for the right of all individuals to make their own moral decisions about childbearing. Of course, you know she needs abortion on demand there, which is currently the law of the land. <clears throat> she closes with this. I'm proud to continue that struggle, to defend the rights of all people to their own beliefs. When others try to inflict their views on me, my daughter, or anyone else, that's not morality. It's tyranny. It's unfair. And it's un-American. Close quote. Now, like I said, I, I think that's really well written. I wish I would have written something like that. That is clear. That is compelling. That is persuasive. And I think it captures an ethic or an understanding about how morality ought to work in our culture. The problem is, is it's deeply flawed. And the flaw is that Faye Waddleton presumes that there is such a place one could stand that might be called morally neutral ground. Okay, what do I mean by that? Morally neutral ground is a place where you can stand in which you have your own moral views on a variety of different things. And you keep them to yourself in that you follow those yourself, but you, make, you do not make those incumbent on other people. They're your views. Someone else in his or her own island of moral neutrality might have different views 
and different responses to the exact same moral circumstances that you might find yourself into, but they have different answers. What you have is true for what? For you. And what they have is true for, for them. And the space in between is a space of non-judgmentalism. One doesn't judge the other. And that space has a name for it in our culture. What do you think that name is? Tolerance. We call that tolerance. Such that if you breach this neutrality and presume to judge another person's behavior, then you have violated the dictates of tolerance. Now, here's the problem with understanding morality in our culture in that way, and this is largely the way it's embraced, is that this view itself is not neutral. In fact, when you look at what uh, Faye Waddleton says, look at how she starts out. She says, like most parents, I think that a sense of moral responsibility is one of the greatest gifts I can give my child. But teaching morality doesn't mean imposing my moral viewpoints on others. Now, my question is, what is it then that Faye Waddleton teaches little Felicia she's growing up. Does she say, Felicia, it's my job to instill you a sense of moral responsibility. I happen to believe in honesty. I happen to believe in bedtimes. I happen to believe in education and homework. I happen to believe in respecting elders. But that's just my personal moral point of view. Far be it for me to impose it on you. Do whatever you want. Now, of course, if she did that, she would not be passing on a sense of moral responsibility, she would be abrogating her responsibility to do so. So she cannot even fulfill what she says she wants to fulfill based on her view of morality as she's expressed it here. And her view is simply that all views are equal and worthy of the same respect, except if you disagree with that view. If you disagree with her relativism, that all views are equally worthy of respect, then your view is not worthy of what? Respect. In fact, she has some choice words to describe the person who doesn't hold to her view. She says that person is tyrannous, unfair, and un-American. In case you didn't know, those are moral judgments. Uh, not only that, she, she has her own personal moral point of view that she's seeking to impose on others. She says, I have devoted my career to assuring a world in which my daughter Felicia can inherit that legacy. What legacy? Her point of view. And how has she, what does she do in her career to ensure that Felicia inherits that legacy? She works as a, as a uh, lobbyist passing laws which, by threat of punishment, force people to do as she thinks is best. Now, I need to make a qualification here. I am not bothered whatsoever that Faye Waddleton seeks to do that. This is the American way. Everybody gets a vote. Everybody gets a voice. I mean, if one person can prevail through the force of logic and, and good thinking on another group of people so that they vote in their way and this gets passed into law, that's the way the system works. That doesn't bother me. The only point I'm making is it's not neutral. It's a point of view. It's a point of view that she thinks is correct, and not just correct, but morally correct that she's seeking to impose on others by the force of law. And just to sharpen the point a bit, uh, in 1994, um, Congress passed a law that said that you cannot block the opening of abortion clinic. There was a lot of pro-life demonstrators that were doing that, so there's a law passed to stop that. And I don't know whether you agree or not agree with the law. That's irrelevant, although I think it's kind of interesting that a woman can do whatever she wants with her own body, except throw it in front of the door of an abortion clinic, but that's another argument and another talk. What was interesting was the response of Pamela Moraldo on the radio, who was then the president of Planned Parenthood, to the law. And, of course, she was very happy with it. And she said this, this law goes, now tell me, think about what's wrong with this statement. This law goes to show that no one can force their morality on someone else again. Well, all laws force a morality, for goodness sake, including that one. That's exactly what was happening there. She's not neutral. That's the whole point. And so there is a posturing here that has to do with those who hold this view and champion the view of relativism in one of its forms against those who are arrogant and narrow-minded to hold that they have a moral point of view that is actually correct. The only point I'm making is those who are, who are, who are offering these challenges are themselves convinced that their own view is correct and others ought to change to their way. You know, there was a, some of you might have seen 
Uh, last year, about this time, there was a big hullabaloo around Chicago because the Southern Baptists had just announced they were going to Chicago. Uh, these, these were evangelical Christians who took seriously Jesus' command to go out to the world and preach the gospel in obedience to their Savior as followers of Christ. They were going to go to Chicago. And uh, preaching the gospel to everyone, including Jews. Now, this is deeply offensive to some Jews. Not to all, as it turns out, but to some. And, uh, in fact, this desire to simply go and share one's view with others was characterized as fomenting hate crimes. And so this made it onto the TV show, uh, Larry King. And so there were uh, the president of the Southern Baptist. You have a Jews for Jesus guy who's kind of on the side of the Southern Baptist. And then you have two rabbis, one from Chicago and one from New York. And so you can imagine this got a bit heated because these rabbis were mad. And I can understand that to a certain degree. They, they were upset because, as they pointed out, when you come and try to change my religious views, you are saying that I'm wrong in my view. Well, yeah, I guess that does kind of go together. And then they said, essentially, in very heated uh, tones, don't do that. Well, that's an interesting kind of response, isn't it, given the nature of the objection? The rabbi said, one of them said, the New York rabbi said, you know what, um, you shouldn't be taking your religion to religious people and trying to change their religious views. If you want to go, you know, peddle your religion somewhere, go to the people who don't have any religion. We already got one, leave us alone. Now, whose view was that being expressed there? The rabbi's view, right? It was his view about evangelism, basically. It was his religious viewpoint about religious uh, promulgation. And what was going on here? He was objecting that the Christians were trying to change his point of view by saying that he was wrong and they should he should adopt their view. And what was his response? No, the other is true. You Christians are wrong in following the Great Commission of your Savior, and you ought to adopt my religious view about evangelism. The fact is, he was doing exactly the same thing. Thing that he was complaining the Christians ought not do. I had a student come to me once who was going to university kind of like this, and she said, I talked to my anthropology professor, and my anthropology professor was very supportive of me in my Christianity. And then I told her that I was really interested in becoming a missionary, and that upset my professor a lot. And she said to me, you know, it's wrong for you to change, try to go out and change other people's religious views. And so she came to me, or she might have called me on the, on the radio, and she said, how do I respond to that? I said, you go back to your professor, and you ask the professor this question. Maybe some of you already thought of this. Are you trying to what? Change my religious views. You see, the professor was, again, doing the very thing that she was telling the student not to do. What does this demonstrate? That the professor is wrong? No. That the rabbis are wrong? No. The point is they're not neutral. It doesn't matter what side theologically you come down on. Whether you believe that the Jewish view of the world is correct or the Christian view, that's not my point. My point is everybody's got a point of view, and they think they're right, and they're arguing for that. But one group largely is posturing as if they're neutral and they're not. When it comes to the moral questions, there is no place of genuine neutrality except for silence. You want to be really neutral, as if, morally speaking, if you are really a moral relativist, the only thing that you have at your disposal that is consistent with moral neutrality is silence. The minute you open your mouth in the face of any egregious moral wrong and make a moral recommendation, you have violated your neutrality, you have taken a moral position, and you have affirmed the existence of moral absolutes at that point. Unless, of course, you're very careful to say, but this is just my personal preference. I, m my preference is that that's wrong, but I, I can't... I'm not condemning you. And then the question can be raised, then why are you talking at all? <laughs> if this is just your preference, why should I care whether you like broccoli or Brussels sprouts? It's irrelevant, right? But hidden in there is the kind of the assumption that you have a moral obligation to care about what I care about. So the morality is smuggled in the back door there. No, if we are going to be consistent relativists, then we can't make any moral judgments whatsoever. And a lot of folks are, are very inconsistent here. They, they, they don't want moral judgments against them, but they want moral just ju judgments in favor of them. Do you know that good is a moral judgment as well? I'm, I'm really looking forward to the time when somebody who I've had a discussion with about moral relativism comes up to me and says, you know, after they've made their case, 
uh, against morality or objective morality. And then they said, you know, I saw what you did over to that to that person as you're talking. That person is really having a hard time. That was really good of you to do that. And then I could say, how dare you push your morality on me? Because good is a moral judgment just like bad is. And if there are no morals that are objective in any sense, then the word good is just as meaningless as the word bad. Uh, let me give you one other illustration to point out this problem with moral neutrality. My kid was raised, uh, my, my brother's kids were raised in um, Florida. I'm sorry, in, uh, he's in Florida now, but he was in uh, Maui <coughs> in Hawaii. And uh, the, when they were in third and fourth grade, they went through these exercises called a values clarification. This is the idea where problems are given to the children and they're expected to work them out. They're moral problems. And they're expected to work them out on their own and come to their own conclusions, clarify their own values. Now, they're not given any guidelines. They're not given any directions here. They're just given the problem. And I think the one that my nephew and niece had to deal with was a man who had killed his wife who was aging and ill and suffering. And so it was a euthanasia kind of thing, a mercy killing. And they were asked, gee, under these circumstances, should, should we punish this poor old man who took his wife? life under these circumstances. And so even the illustrations, I think, are a little bit abusive um, and suggestive of an answer. But in any event, they don't give any outward directives. My brother found out about what was going on in the classroom. He got real upset. He came to the class, and he talked later on afterwards to the teacher. The teacher was quite defensive. He said, I don't understand why you're upset, because we are not pushing our morality on them. We are telling them it's up to them. We're not telling them what to do. We're not giving them any guidelines. It's completely their decision. We're neutral, was the claim. And my brother, it was a great observation. He said, you know, when you tell my, you give my children difficult moral problems to solve, some of the most difficult that anybody has to deal with, and then you tell them, by the way, there are no moral rules to guide you. There are no absolutes that will help you out in this. There are no directives that will give you answers in these circumstances, but it's simply up to you. Well, that's not neutral. That is the aggressive promotion of a particular point of view called moral relativism. Now, that's, that deals with, I think, to a great degree, this problem of apparent uh, neutrality, which there isn't any, and the tolerance that's attached to it. Because the challenge of intolerance is also itself a moral challenge. It's a claim that some moral thing is true, that is, the rule that you ought to tolerate, whatever that means, and the meaning of that has shifted over the years, uh, to almost mean the opposite now is what it used to mean by the way, but it still carries in the minds of many people the same moral imperative. So that if you're intolerant, you've done something what? Wrong. And wrong is a moral term. And if you're a relativist, then you can't have any kind of thing wrong. Now, I'd like to give you a handful of, um, of flaws um, in, in relativism. Uh, before I do that, though, I want to... Um, I want to clarify something here about the whole issue, because I keep reusing this term moral to describe relativism. We call it moral relativism. The reason I do that is because that is the terminology in the field, as it were, to describe it. But I, want, I don't want you to misunderstand the nature of moral, uh, moral relativism as if it is a moral alternative that is an alternative way of thinking morally about moral rules, because it turns out that relativism is not a refinement of how we understand morality. It is a denial of how we understand morality. And I'm going to give you a very simple illustration to show how this is true. Um, you can judge the validity of a moral principle by looking at the principle in action, as it were. Finding the person who is the best exemplar of that principle, who, who uh, is something like the hero of the principle, who lives it out to something like perfection, and by gazing at the the individual themselves, you can, in and, and the presence of virtue, if it's there, commends the moral principle that, 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 that uh, helped this person to become that way. For example, if your moral principle is you should always help other people in need at all times and take no thought for your own needs. Well, what does a person look like who lives that out to something like perfection? Well, you live like that and it produces a Mother Teresa. You behold a Mother Teresa and you can see the obvious virtue in her life. And uh, as a result, you think, that must be a pretty good moral rule that produces this kind of individual. Or you could say um, that whenever you have to resist the government, you do so with nonviolent passive resistance. And that living that out to some kind of perfection, the moral hero of that view might be a Gandhi or, or Dr. Martin Luther King. If your moral view is, um, 
you should always uh, obey the Father in heaven in everything that you do. Uh, you see a person who lives this out to perfection, it produces a Jesus Christ. And you say, Jesus Christ, moral rule, must be a pretty good moral rule that produces this kind of human being. Okay, that's our motif. How does that apply to relativism? So my question is, what is the champion of relativism? What is the hero of relativism? What is the kind of person that lives according to the dictates of relativism most consistently? And we have a word for that kind of person in the English language, a person who has no concern for other people's idea of right and wrong, who follows his or her own views of right and wrong, and marches most consistently to the beat of their own moral drum. It's a homicide detective's worst nightmare. It's a, it's a person without a conscience, sociopath. Now, friends, there's got to be something wrong with an appropriate, uh, with, a, with, a, with a, 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 a possible or a, a, um, offered point of view, moral point of view of relativism that it produces as its logical result, as its purpose, not as a wild spin-off, not as like, well, it, we, everybody gets a little strange one now, but this is the goal. It produces a sociopath. And this is why we don't teach relativism to our kids. We like it for ourselves, but we don't teach our kids that. And this is why relativism has been rejected by every single moral leader in the history of the world that stood head or shoulders above anyone else. You take whoever you want. You can take Moses, you can take Krishna, you can take Buddha, you take Jesus Christ, you can take the Apostle Paul, you can take Aristotle, you can take Martin Luther King. Whoever stood head and shoulders above them all condemned this as immoral. The person who's a relativist has no morality, period. Now, I know this is offensive to some people. They say, well, they don't like someone taking the moral label away from them. And they'll say things like, how, how dare you say that? I have, mor I have my morality. I do whatever's right for me. That's my morality. That's my point. Because morality isn't doing whatever's right for you. Morality is doing what's right, trying to figure out what's right and then doing it. That's morality. Okay, now this kind of introduces us to this whole concept and to the problem with moral, uh, the moral neutrality and the problem with tolerance and even the problem with calling relativism moral because it's a denial of morality not a version of morality. I'm going to give you four or five what I consider uh, fatal flaws in the book on relativism. We have, uh, I think we have seven or eight um, on the book that, um, that we go through to show why relativism is false as a view of morality. Um, but I have to tell you how I'm going to argue here because I'm arguing in a very particular way. I'm arguing using something that's called an intuition. Now, when I say intuition, I mean something particular. I don't mean like women's intuition or, or the, the ability that some people have when they're in a field for a long time to come up with a quick answer. Uh, if you're a doctor, uh, you, you know, you've done it so often that you just kind of take a look at the circumstances and subconsciously all your learning comes to play and you come up with a diagnosis and it may be right because you're just good at this after learning. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a way of knowing something that you don't know how you knew it a way of knowing that's built in. From a philosophical perspective, this way of knowing is right on the very bottom tier. You don't get to this knowledge by some other means. It's just there. For example, I say to you, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is moral. See? Now, how do you know that? I've done this dozens and dozens of times with different audiences, not always a stellar educated group like this here at UCLA, but uh, just normal folk, and they come up with the answer. How did they know that? And if I pressed you on that, you would say, uh, I don't know, you can just see it, right? You can just, if you know the meaning of the first two things, and that makes sense, then the other just follows. And, and if I asked you to prove that to me, that it follows, you would, you would be at wit's end to do so because you'd say, well, that is the proof. That, if you don't see it, I don't even know how I get there if it's not obvious to you. Frankly, if I said that I didn't see that, you would probably think there was something wrong with me. Like, you know, come on, what, what is, what, what's missing up there, right? Uh, if I said that Mary is shorter than Bob and Bob is shorter than Bill, what would I know about Mary to Bill? That she was 
shorter. Right, okay, so I did the, I, I gave you a little help because this is mostly undergraduates here, so I, <clears throat> I gave you some help. But you would have figured it out even if I hadn't done the, the, the visual, if you understand the words. Now, these are examples of, that's the transitive relationship, I think, right? These are, these are examples of rational intuitions. These are things that you kind of got built in there and that operate without any justification. Now, I think there are not only rational intuitions, I think there are moral intuitions as well. They're moral intuitions that inform our behavior and inform our language. And they pop up all the time. My point simply here is, if these moral intuitions are misinformed, if there is no objective morality, then the things that inform our moral intuitions turn out to be nonsense. So we might say something like, uh, rape is wrong. All right, and why would we say, why would we condemn rape if we didn't have a moral intuition that rape is somehow morally objectionable? Actually so, not just to us. You know, but actually wrong in itself. And um, by the way, when, when I'm arguing on the basis of moral intuitions, I don't really bear a burden of proof here. What I'm trying to do is appeal to something that I think you already know. And so I'm not going to prove, other than making this appeal to intuition, the points that, I'm to, uh, 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 that will follow. For example, if you told me, well, I, it's not clear to me that rape is wrong, uh, my response is not going to say, be, well, I think you have an interesting alternate morality. My response is going to be, get help. I mean, something's wrong with you, it seems to me, if this is not a self-presenting moral principle. Now, uh, I'm not just simply going to assert that, though. I think, by and large, you folks believe this. And this is what I meant by Christianity resonating, that the principles and the, the, the worldview of Christianity and the view of Jesus resonating with our deepest intuitions about the world. Because I'm not trying to persuade you of this. I think you already believe it. And I think you believe it because of the way you talk about the nature of the world. And I'm going to give you some examples about the way you talk about things that evidence your deep commitment to objective morality. And this makes up the seven fatal flaws or whatever. I'm just going to give you three or four of them. First of all, if a, a person is a relativist, he must surrender all language that pertains to moral wrongdoing. That is, a relativist can never say, that person did something wrong. Now, he might be able to say, I didn't like what happened. I wouldn't do that if I were him. It's not my cup of tea. But he could never offer a legitimate judgment on anyone else for anything being wrong. That would be like saying you broke a rule in a game that has no rules. You know, what if your game that you're playing has the whole earth as its you know, this is the whole earth. There's no boundaries. You say, hey, you're out of bounds. You say, what do you mean, out of bounds? There's no boundaries in this game. By the same token, when you say there are no moral rules and then you claim somebody's wrong, that's like saying they've gone out of bounds in a game that has no boundaries. It's nonsense. And what's going to have to happen then is you're going to have to bite the bullet and acknowledge that people like Hitler and Pol Pot and Idi Amin and the rest of them were completely within their moral rights, as it were, to do whatever they preferred in the moment as long as they had the power to accomplish it. You couldn't say they were wrong because wrong is violating a moral rule. And if your view is that there are no moral rules, you can't say they're violating them. Now, you just have to ask yourself, friends, the question. Does it seem like there are some things that it's appropriate to say, that's just wrong? I don't care what anybody says. That's just wrong. If you feel justified in virtue of your moral intuition, to use the word wrong in that way, and by the way, everybody does. That's why they use it so often. Then relativism must be false. Here's another flaw. And very few people have even thought about this. If relativism is true, you could never, ever complain about the problem of evil in the world. Now, you think about that for a moment. One of the regular, probably the most tenacious objections to uh, what Jesus believed is the objection of evil in the world. How could there be a good and loving God if there's all this evil in the world? Now, do you realize that the objection, first of all, it's a fair objection. I fully sympathize with it, and it needs to be addressed. And I think it can be. We have some teaching on it. And others have talked about I think Bill Craig was here. Dr. William Lane Craig was here last year, and he spoke on it as well. But uh, there are answers to it. But what's interesting to me is that that the question is raised at all. And what does it tell us about the nature of our beliefs about the universe if we raise the question? You Christians must be wrong because there's evil in the world and you say God is good. And my first question is going to be, what is it? Can you help me out a little bit here and help me understand what it is that you mean by evil in the world? You see, for this objection to be sustained, to even be spoken, there's got to be 
evil in the world. There's got to be objective evil, not just our subjective preferences. Now, just about two years ago, I think almost this week, we had this ghastly shooting in Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. And two members of the trench coat mafia, high school students, came in at lunchtime, guns blaring, tossing pipe bombs left and right. When the dust settled and the smoke cleared, 14 kids were dead. Two, the two shooters had taken their life. A teacher was dead also. That happened on a Tuesday around noontime. The following Monday, I was at Long Beach City College in a debate on Christianity versus atheism. What do you think came up in the discussion? What was on the headlines of every newspaper around the country for that whole week. In fact, the LA Times headline in the Metro section said, where was God? Now, it's interesting, given that response, and like I said, I'm sympathetic to that response. I understand how people can raise that question, but what is necessary to be in place for someone to legitimately raise that objection is a commitment to the idea that there is evil in the world, and this is an example of it. Because if there is no God and there is no morality, if relativism is the right way to look at it, there are a lot of things you could say about what happened at Little in Colorado in that spring of 1999. Oh, you could say that. That really upset me. Uh, I didn't like that. I wish it hadn't happened. I would never do something like that. You could talk about all these things that turn out to be reporting a personal autobiography. But one thing you could never say, if morals are relative, is that what happened at Littleton, Colorado was evil. You could never say it was wicked. And I don't know about you, but whatever you say about what happened in Littleton, Colorado, that's the one thing it seems we must say. And if we say that that was wicked and that was evil or anything else like it, and there are many examples, then that objection can only make sense if morals are objective in some sense and relativism is false. Now, you can go down the line. What about justice and fairness? Uh, do we complain about the lack of justice in the legal system? Well, what is justice? Justice is a moral good, an objective moral good that we ought to obey. It's wrong to punish the innocent in virtue of his innocence and to let the guilty go free in virtue of his guilt. I mean, this is just obviously in unjust. And this is why when we see things like that, the word injustice comes out of our mouth just like that and many other words like them, because we are spontaneously making moral judgments about circumstances that we understand they have moral qualities to them. That's not fair. Well, if you're a relativist, this is nonsense, because fairness is a moral good, a moral obligation. And if there are no moral obligations, then the word fairness not only is like wrong or false, it's incoherent. It doesn't point to anything. It has, it's just like blabity blab. You might as well just say that. Oh, that's blabity blab because it doesn't have any more meaning. Now, why do we chuckle? Because we know that justice and fairness are not blabbity blab kind of things, right? That there is a moral intuition that we have about the nature of the world that is informing our language. And that if we, if we hold to our relativism, then we must acknowledge that the language that we're using to describe all of these things is nonsense. And you can go right down the line. I said I had eight of them, here's one more. If you're a relativist, you cannot demand tolerance. Because the moral obligation of tolerance doesn't make any sense at all in a relativistic worldview. It certainly makes sense in my worldview, but that's because I think that there are things that are right and wrong. It's not just my opinion. I mean, if I'm intolerant, then I'm wrong. Even if I happen to like it, even if I happen to approve of it, even if I don't believe in that view, I still am judged wrong because the rule of tolerance is an objective thing that applies to everyone in the same situation. And if, if it turns out that relativism is true, then we live in a world in which nothing is wrong, nothing is evil, nothing is worthy of praise or blame. There is no justice or injustice in which there is no tolerance. And I promise you something, friends, a world that promotes relativism will produce that kind of world. And this is why we subtitled the book, Feet Firmly Planted in midair. And I'm going to let you in here in just kind of my closing remarks before our Q&A. A little secret about this whole thing. I know some of you are thinking, well, who could really believe that kind of thing? Who could live that way? Here's my answer. Nobody can and nobody does. 
you almost never find a real relativist. So people can talk this way, but they can't live this way. They know better. And so you could be talking to somebody, uh, you know, in the line at, at, at the bank or something, uh, and there you're trying to argue for some type of absolute morality, and they're promoting their relativism, and, <clears throat> and, the, and, and they're waxing eloquent about it, and then <clears throat> somebody cuts in front of them in line, right? And they say, hey, back of the line, you shouldn't do that. Now, they don't then add, and by the way, that's just my personal moral view. It has nothing to do with you, so please just ignore my comment. No, they think the person actually did something wrong, don't they? And so they'll wax eloquent about uh, moral relativism and then in the next breath complain about somebody cutting in line, uh, talk about the injustice of the legal system, talk about the unfairness at work, uh, talk about those arrogant, narrow-minded, bigoted uh, fundamentalists who are cramming their truth down our throats all of which are nonsense if it turns out that relativism is true. Now, I don't think they're nonsense. I don't think you think they're nonsense either. And if that's the case, then relativism must be false. And they kind of, uh, the, the, the fact that it's false kind of expresses itself in odd ways in our conversation, even from people who consider themselves dyed in the world rel relativists, who are the quickest to respond, don't judge me, or who are you to tell me what I should do or don't push your morality on me. I had a conversation in the same chiropractor's office with a young man named Gil. And th this whole conversation is in the book. <clears throat> and Gil was a real nice guy, easygoing, um, didn't hold to my view of the world at all, but he was willing to talk about it. And so in the process of me getting physical therapy, uh, we talked about spiritual things. And, and at one point, and he's very easygoing, a very tolerant type, right? <clears throat> Until it got to the point where I in, in the conversation about moral issues, it became clear that I thought homosexuality was immoral. Oh, no, he didn't like that. Now, I wasn't, you know, beating up on anybody. I was just making a point. And he, he didn't like that. He said, you know, you Christians, you, a lot of you guys are nice people. And uh, a lot of things to like about you. But before long, you start getting judgmental. Now, Gil didn't realize it, but he just made a big mistake. And so I was going to try to help him to see his mistake. And by asking him a question, I said, okay, Gil, well, what... I don't understand why you're angry. What's wrong with what I did? And he goes, <clears throat> I'm overacting here a little bit to make the point. He said, you are judging and it's not right to judge. Well, what is that? <laughs> and I said, well, Gil, if it's not right to judge, then why are you judging me right now? Now, he had never, ever heard anything like that before. And he kind of drops back a few steps there, and he's rubbing his chin, trying to, think, trying to regroup a little bit. You know, I said, what the heck was that? You know, all right. I said, no, no, no. And I can hear him kind of mumbling under his breath as he's trying to, no, no, that's not what I'm uh, Stop and start. And finally he says, all right, well, I guess I, guess I was judging you. You're, you're right. I, I guess it's okay to judge. That's what he said. He didn't want to give up his judgment, you know. He said, I guess it's okay to judge. And then he adds this caveat. He says, as long as you don't push your morality on other people, once you push your morality, you cross the line. That's, you can judge, but don't push your morality. Now, he thought he'd approved his lot. He just went out of the frying pan into the fire. Because then I was ready with another question. What do you think my question was? Gil, is that your morality? What you've just expressed to me, that you shouldn't push your morality on other people. He said, yeah. He didn't see it coming. I said, then why are you pushing it on me right now. Oh, yes, yeah, let's see. He says he's rubbing his chin again. Finally, he makes a couple other false starts, and he can't get going, you know. And finally, he says, he says, it's not fair. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I can't find a way to say it in which it sounds right. He thought I was playing a word trick on him, you know. I said, Gil, it doesn't sound right because it's not right. It's self-refuting. It's like you're saying there, is no, there, there are no moral rules. Here's one. Okay. And sometimes I have these kind of conversations with people, and they'll, uh, they'll get all frustrated. And they'll say, well, now you got me all confused, you know. I said, no, I, I think you were a little confused when you started. Uh, <laughs> you just now figured that out, you know. This is characteristic of a lot of people who want to champion relativism and at the same time cannot avoid making moral judgments. This is kind of like passive-aggressive. You know what passive-aggressive is? When people say two different things at the same time? They say like, uh, 
uh, they say something loudly and they say the second thing quietly. And it's the quiet thing that's really true. So like a gal say, yeah, you know, I got divorced last year, but I'm completely over it. I don't hold any grudges against that jerk. Okay, see the passive aggressive there. So which part is true? The, I don't hold any grudges or the jerk part? The jerk part is what she really believes. That's the way passive aggressive works. Well, this is kind of a passive aggressive. There are no moral rules, therefore you shouldn't judge me. Well, if there are no moral rules, then how can there be the moral rule that you shouldn't judge other people? There, are no, there is no truth, therefore you ought to tolerate different views. Well, if there's no truth, then there's no moral truth that you ought to tolerate different points of view. It's a good reason to do whatever you want if there is no morality. So when people ask me, they say to me, don't push your morality on me. I say, why not? Now, see that silence right there? That's what I get back. Because there's no way for them to answer that without at the same time doing what? Pushing their morality on me. You see, people believe in morality so deeply that it comes out even when they're trying to deny it. Now, if relativism is false, and I think it's a bankrupt view, and I've given you some reasons why I think that's the case, then that means some form of moral objectivism has got to be true. Maybe there's only one, and I'm not promoting any particular view right now. Maybe there's only one moral rule in the, in the whole world, that you, and that moral view is that you shouldn't torture babies, that moral rule is you shouldn't torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to gay bash, or uh, intolerance is wrong. Or, I mean, pick whatever your favorite thing is. If there is only one moral principle in the universe, we have just made an unbelievable discovery. In the process of reflecting on the nature of the world, we have discovered a moral rule, some moral obligation that applies to us as human beings that is not physical. I mean, you can ask yourself the question, what the heck is a moral rule? But one thing it isn't, it isn't something you're going to bump into in the dark. It doesn't extend in space. It doesn't have physical qualities. You can't examine it by physics. It's something that science has no access to in principle. But it's something we know just the same to be, the so, to be so. Now, if it turns out that there's one non-physical reality that science can't speak to, but we can actually know, it might be that there's a whole bunch of other things that are non-physical, that are unaccessible to science, even in principle, but are still things we can be reasonably certain of. And that's the liberating idea I want to leave you with. If there is morality in the world, and it's appropriate under some circumstances to demand tolerance from people and, and, to, and to require that human beings not be mistreated, well, then we've got to ask ourselves, what gives force to this moral obligation? If the moral obligation is just an accident, well, I don't know why we should obey it, frankly. When we look at the nature of it, laws, even in our own societies, moral obligations are things that, that pass between minds. You might have a moral obligation to me, but you don't have a moral obligation to a disembodied principle that's just floating around in the universe. And I want to suggest to you that the best explanation for the existence of moral rules that we're all aware of in some measure, and there might be some debate about the details, which is okay, but foundationally, there are some moral rules in place. The best explanation is not, is not going to be relativism, which is denial of moral rules. It's not going to be that moral rules just happen by chance, but rather they didn't happen by chance. They happened by non-chance. In other words, they're functions of mind. Someone is behind the moral rules. Some moral ruler is responsible for the moral rules themselves. And that means when we break a moral rule, we're not just violating a principle, but we are offending the one who made the rule. Now, this may be a new concept to some of you, but I just want you to stay with me for a moment. Because if that's the case, and it certainly seems to be in the running to me, I could be wrong about this, but I've done a lot of thinking about it, and I don't think there's a better explanation. It, it, this fits with the way we understand how moral rules or how rules and obligations work across the board. They're functions of mind. And if we have transcendent moral rules that apply to all human beings, this seems to suggest a transcendent mind behind it. Therefore, when we violate the moral rules, we are, vi we are offending the moral rule maker. And this begins to explain something. I know something that's true about every single person in this room that you don't know that I know. And you think most people don't know. 
And here's what it is. I know that you struggle with a bad self-image. Now, how do I know that? Because everybody does, in some measure, including me. What happens is we look down inside of ourselves and we see what's there, what nobody else sees, and the thing we see, to some degree, is something we do not like, and we know that what we see that we don't like is moral. Something's wrong with us. And we try to hide it. We try to deny it. We try to pretend it's not there. But when we're alone in our secret moments, we know for sure it's real. And we do all kinds of things to compensate. And one way to compensate is just to simply deny it. That's relativism. <clears throat> the answer to guilt, that's what you're feeling, is not denial. I'd like to suggest that the answer to guilt is forgiveness. Did you ever consider that maybe the reason you feel guilty is because you are guilty? I mean, is that possible? Is that within the range of possibilities? And that's why we hunger to have forgiveness, to get out from underneath this. And this is where Jesus comes in. You see, we're talking about relativism and about a philosophic issue in ethics, but it cashes out in very real terms to us. Because as we reflect on our own lives, we realize that this is something we actually believe in. This is something Jesus believed in, too. We also believe in our own sense of personal guilt. We have an obligation for having violated the very laws that we say are in place and apply to human beings. And that means we're in trouble. And what Jesus offers is a solution that works. Because we haven't just broken the rule, we have offended the rule maker. And the rule maker became a man in order to make a payment to make your forgiveness possible. And a lot of ways to characterize that, you probably heard different ways. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that now. I just want you to see that this whole thing about morality relates to the basic message that has to do with following Christ. This whole thing about sin and guilt wasn't just some make me up to drum up new, new business. Jesus is a physician that came to heal a sickness that all of us have. And that I think we're all aware of in our honest moments. And I encourage you to give the healer serious consideration for your deadly condition. Well, that's all I have to say in a, of a formal nature. What I'd like to do is open time here for questions. We've got about uh, 15 minutes. And as you're thinking about the question that you'd like to ask, and you don't even need to come up to the mic. Do they need the mic for the taping, or can I just reproduce? Can I just um, repeat? It's better to come up to the mic. Okay, so take a little act of courage and bravery there. Come up to the mic. Uh, but in this packet of information, the, basically it's the standard reason propaganda, okay? It's the organization I represent. Please take a look at it. It tells you about the radio show. It tells you about the website. We get 40,000 hits. We get 40,000 visitors a month. That's in the hundreds of thousands of hits. Got a lot of activity there, 300 uh, plus pieces you can download for free, all kinds of commentaries. But I want you to see this piece called uh, Solid Ground. This is, a, this is a, uh, an, uh, an article that I write every other month and send it out to you. We'd like to send it out to you and help you to understand from an intellectual perspective why Christianity is worth thinking about. But we just need to know where you live, so that's what this little card is for. If you take a moment right now and fill this card out and give it to us back at the table at the end, we'll make sure that you receive Solid Ground for free for a year, along with some other things that might help you as a seeker or a questioner about the nature of the